Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. You've written an intriguing book that takes us on a journey through your life. You know, it, it starts off in a place that many people are familiar with, growing up in a very religious household as a Jehovah's Witness. Now, they, people may not be familiar with that part yeah. as the religion, but everyone's grown up, or many people have grown up religious. And you begin this journey that slowly changes over time. Let's start with that part before we really reveal where your journey takes you. What is it like to be a Jehovah's Witness? I mean, because we laugh from the outside. Um, I know you do. <laughs> no, no, really. I've people, heard the jokes. Yes, people are just, you know what I mean, the knocking on the yeah. doors and the people, like, like, the, like, as a Jehovah's Witness, did you know about that or were you, were, were you completely oblivious? I think as a Jehovah's Witness, every time, if in a movie there was a joke about a Jehovah's Witness or in a comedy show, we kind of liked it because it kind of, we would laugh along with it and it was like, at least we were getting some attention. Right. Maybe it was a way of being in the world because we lived kind of cut off from the world in our own way. Interesting. But, you know, Prince was a Jehovah's Witness, so there, are, there were mainstream people, and we were very excited when that happened. Oh, that's an interesting one. Yeah. There's, there's a part of the book that I, that I really enjoy. It's early on where you talk about how you would go to these houses and you would knock on people's doors. And some of these neighborhoods were really rich and fancy. Yeah. And some people would cuss you out. Some people would threaten you and tell you to leave. Other people wouldn't answer. But there's a beautiful line in the book where you say, I would come back the next year and I would be shocked that these sinners are still alive. And you'd be like, that's not what my religion has told me. They should be dead by now. Mm -hmm. was, that a, was that a weird moment for you or did you just push it to the back of your head? I mean, I guess it was... We had been taught from being very young that the world was going to end any day. Like, in, in our children's books, there was centerfold spreads, artists' conceptions of what Armageddon would look like. Right. And we were just little kids reading this, but there were pictures of, like, fire coming down from heaven, yes. wiping out all the people, basically all of you. No offense. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, it, I think it was something that was constantly on our mind, and that's why we lived the way that we did, because we thought the world was ending. I mean, why do you think we spent so much time preaching? It's, right. You know, it wasn't because that much fun. Yeah, believe. Yeah, we believed. Yeah. yeah. And there was a certain smugness, you know, like, where we felt like we had the truth and we were sharing with people, and if they didn't listen, well, too bad. <laughs> you truly believed in a way that I find admirable, because... In the book, you talk about how you left America and moved to China to preach and to be a missionary. And China, for those who don't know, is one of the countries where it's illegal to do that. You're not allowed yeah. to preach religion to people. You're not allowed to be a missionary. So that, like, takes a, a real level of belief. Why China and why would you take that risk? Um, I think that there was probably... I, I mean, I had been raised as a Jehovah's Witness, so I did fully believe it. And I really did want to help people. I, my motives, you know, in my own mind were pure, that I thought I was saving pe people's... Sorry, I thought I was saving people's lives. Right. Um, but I think also there was probably some latent thing in me where I wanted an adventure. Mm -hmm. Because when you're a Jehovah's Witness, as most of you probably know, a lot of people don't open their doors. Yes, we Or know. We know. <laughs> slam the doors. <laughs> <laughs> And so, you know, that gets a little tiresome after a while. So I think that that was part of it, too. And, you know, if you went to a country where no one had ever preached before, it feels like fresh territory. It's like you got new blood. <laughs> right. It, it, it's, it's an interesting world that you take us into. What, what, what's really beautiful, though, is when you start witnessing the change is because you go out to be a missionary to these people <laughs> out there to tell them about you, uh, being a Jehovah's Witness. And in a strange way, it's almost like they start converting you because you meet people who tell you about the world. You pe meet people who show you a different perspective. And that started to shift your views on religion. In what way? Yeah, that's, a, <clears throat> that's exactly what happened in that... Um, I think when I was at home... Well, first of all, I didn't get that far. I didn't really, you know, come to the point where someone would sit down and listen to me and, you know, listen to me go through our books and study right. with them in my hometown. But in China, more people would, would listen to what I had to say. And I think being in a different language and a different culture, it kind of really disoriented me. And even learning Chinese, I learned Mandarin, um, learning that language, it's not just like a, a language where you can just translate from English. You really have to kind of excavate your mind and change the way you think in order to speak it. But also, there was the strange side effect of being in this country where, as we all know, there's not a lot of freedom. But for a Jehovah's Witness in China, there was a lot of freedom because the organization anywhere else in the world is very structured and quite insular, and you have a lot of meetings and preaching right. that you do. And in China, because the work is done secretly under, you know, it's under ban there, uh, suddenly I just had a, a lot more freedom and time on my own and also the opportunity to meet people and talk more deeply with them, right. people who weren't Jehovah's Witnesses. Honestly, I, I, I don't pass judgment because... As I say, many of us have grown up extremely religiously. 
And those levels of religion are defined across religions. You know, um, some people would label um, Jehovah's Witnesses a cult. They would say it's, it's, it's completely a cult. You speak to that in the book. Others would argue that any religion can become a cult depending on how you practice it. Um, when you look at your life now, you left the religion. And one of the hardest parts of leaving the religion was how you were cut off from your family and your society. It feels like that in of itself it lends itself more to being culty than, than other mainstream religions in a way. Like, what was that like for you? Yeah, I think um, there's a scene in the book where one of the characters tells me I'm in a cult and I react very strongly. I felt really angry and I was adamant that that wasn't true. Right. Does anyone who's in a cult ever know they're in a cult? That's, you know, yeah. I, don't think, I don't think they do. Except <clears throat> the leader, hopefully. Yeah, um, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was when I started to have doubts and questions and started to leave. I think when you try to leave a group and then strange things start happening, that can be when it starts to occur to you that maybe you might have been right. in a cult. You might be in a cult when... Yeah. So, for example, as you said, if you're, you know, it wasn't like I was ranting and raving or, or about it. I wasn't like in the church being like, this is wrong. But I, I mentioned a couple things, maybe some doubts that I had had. And very quickly, my community just shed me as a person. And that's quite a big thing for people who have been taught to build their life around mm -hmm, the community. Mm -hmm. So that felt strange. And then I think the further, you know, I got one step away after that happened. And the further I got away from it, I would start to see other things, examine other things like the different beliefs that they have. And right. Whether they cause harm. I think that's a good gauge whether a group, I mean, religions can do be for a cause for good, but they can also, on the other flip side, can yes. be a cause for harm. Right. So, for example, um, Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in taking blood transfusions, even if it saves your life. And so that's caused thousands of deaths. So that's when I started to think about that more um, with a little bit of distance, it started to me feel like it's not that much different than Kool -Aid, drinking Kool-Aid. Right. People are dying unnecessarily. So there's little signs along the way that start to make me feel that it was a group that was not really a positive, um, didn't have a really positive effect right. on well, a lot of people. When we look at this, this journey, you, you, are, you are traveling into a religion, through a religion, and then out of the religion. The one question I always have for people is, what do you then replace that with in your life? Because, I mean, religion is such a big part of your world yeah. if you are deeply religious. Where have you turned to since then? I mean, you talk in the book about suffering tragic loss. You know, you lost a child. Yeah. Many people would lean on religion in those moments. What have you now turned to in your life to, to replace that, that stability? Yeah, I think that when we go through difficult times or tragedies, the impulse, there's some instinct in us as humans is to look outward, to try and look for something to absolve or like to, to heal the pain. And when you no longer believe, I, for me, it, it wasn't a choice to believe anymore. Once I believed and then kind of like the scales fell from my eyes, to use a biblical term, and then didn't, it wasn't possible for me to just get, return and believe something again. Right. So I think the, the big thing that comes to mind is that when I had, when I was in the religion, I felt like I had the answers to every question, like anything. Why do we die? Why is there suffering? Uh, and then that felt really meaningful, like uh -huh. my life had meaning. But when you, when you leave the religion and you realize that those answers weren't true, well, if an answer isn't true, then it's not meaningful. So basically, when you have some future hope that you no longer believe in, what do you have? You don't have a, you know, a fictional future in front of you. You have what's in front of you now. And for me, just being present in the world and knowing that now my life is finite, it's not going to go on forever, it's kind of made me see the world as a more, be like, the beauty in the world. Right. And even in not having all the answers, I think there's a lot of magic. Um, there's a lot of mystery that we can't know right now, but that can be something that's really meaningful and interesting uh, to consider. Right. And as far as when my, my son died, the thing with, you know, when we do look at the world, there's also pain. There's no denying that. But even I think that the um, pain that, of course, I carry with me due to the loss of my son, um, the, the flip side of it, of that grief, is the depth of the love that I had for him. And so to me, I think when I consider that love of the mother and the child, it really is a transcendent uh -huh. love. And I experienced that love without religion. So to me, I think that life just has meaning inherently. It's just that I've traded in maybe the future for the now. It's a beautiful journey, and it's a really powerful book with some wonderful insights. Thank you so much for being Thank on the you. show. Thank wonderful you. having you here. <laughs> Leaving the Witness is available now. And a score, everybody.